Welcome back, y'all, to hypothesis testing, or what I call classical statistics, or what I call dumb statistics. We'll talk about that later. Also known as null hypothesis significance testing. But first, let's orient. Let's return to our marriage therapy scenario. Remember, we have two groups, those who are in therapy and those who are not. And then we measure marital satisfaction in both groups. And those of frequentist or likelihoodist persuasions believe our experiment is one of many that could have been performed. So let's say we found a five point difference between the two groups. It could have been six points. It could have been four points. It could have been a hundred points. You just don't know. So we use the numbers that we found in our sample to generate a PDF or a probability density function, which remember means it is a mathematical function that tells you the probability of obtaining each and every score given a particular mean and standard deviation. And now we can use those statistics to compute probabilities. So here's the logic of classical statistics. Let's say we had a mean of 55 for the therapy group and a mean of 50 for the no therapy group. Or let's just simplify things and say that this is a mean difference of five. And using this value alone, we actually don't know if the therapy worked and we can't. But what we can do is figure out the probability of obtaining a difference of five if it did not work. What? Oh, you heard me. We assume it didn't work and then figure out how unlikely it would be that we obtained what we actually have if it didn't work. Okay, that seems a little backwards. Oh, you bet it is. So what we do is we assume that the true difference is zero, and we assume the standard deviation of the population is about the same as the standard deviation in the sample. We call this the null distribution, or the distribution of no effect, or the hypothesis of no difference, or the nil distribution, or the dumb distribution, has lots of different names. But the mean difference that we observe could belong to what we call the alternative distribution. But we have no idea where the alternative distribution is. It could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. We have no idea! So we know what the null distribution looks like. We have no idea what the alternative looks like. And so what we're going to do is we are going to assume that the null distribution is true and figure out how unlikely it would be to obtain the difference that we obtained if it was true. And if this probability is low enough, by convention, we say less than 5% probability, then we just assume that it belongs to an alternative distribution. In short, we know a whole lot about the null distribution. We know nothing about the alternative distribution. So we assume the null distribution is true and then figure out the probability of obtaining what we obtained if it was actually true. It's kind of backwards, I know. So why do we choose a 5% probability? Well, because Ronald Fisher, one of the guys who helped invent null hypothesis significance testing, one day said, hmm, what's unlikely enough? Well, I don't know, maybe one time out of a 20, I guess, maybe, who cares, I don't know. And thus it was 5% forevermore, and for all of eternity, and for all of time. If you haven't gotten the point, there's nothing magical about 5%, it's just convention. And then people treat it as if it's the gospel of statistics. It ain't by diggity. When we're doing hypothesis testing, there's two types of errors we could make. One, we call a type one error. And this means we reject the null hypothesis when we really shouldn't have done that. Or basically, we reject the idea that there is no relationship and instead accept the idea that there is a relationship. Ah, oh, the double negatives are killing me. Or in other words, we conclude that our experiment worked when it actually didn't. What's an example of a type one error? How about the link between autisms and vaccines? Are you kidding me? There's no relationship between the two. Time and time again, scientific study after scientific study, we find that there is no relationship. So the original study was a huge type one error. Actually, it was fraud. Did you know that the guy who found the link between autism and vaccinations actually fabricated his data because if he found a link then let's just say he had some deep pockets for a reason so that's a type one error what about a type two error a type two error means we accept the null when the alternative is actually true or we falsely conclude that our experiment didn't work or that there is no relationship between the two variables we're studying. That sucks too. Like let's say you have this revolutionary cancer treatment that's gonna cure all cancer, except for some reason due to chance or whatever, the people who were treated in your study are no different than the people who weren't treated. So you conclude, hey, treatment doesn't work. That sucks, we have to start all over. But dang, guess what? It actually did work. Oops. And now you're gonna scrap a treatment that actually would have saved thousands upon thousands of lives. How do you feel now? I, I wasn't talking to you, by the way, you know. That sucks. Type one errors suck. 
type two errors suck, they all suck. We don't want to commit either. Instead, we want to reject the null when the null is false, and we want to accept the null when the null is true. Or put differently, we want to accept the alternative distribution when the alternative distribution is true. We want to conclude our treatment works if it actually works. And the probability that we will do that, that we will accept the treatment if it actually works, is called power. Or in more statistical language, power is the probability of rejecting the null when the null is actually false. There are five proven ways that you can maximize power in your study and for only $19.95. Who am I kidding? I'm gonna give you this for free because that's how I roll people. Five ways to maximize power. Number one, make the means more different. So again, like before, we had a mean of 55 in the therapy group and a mean of 50 in the no therapy group. Well, wouldn't it be nice if those means were more different? Then it'd be more likely that we would reject the null hypothesis. So maybe the therapy mean is 65 instead of 55. Boy, they look a whole lot different, don't they? Yeah, easier said than done, stats dork. Right you are. But did you really have to call me a dork? Sometimes it isn't feasible to make the means more different, but sometimes it is. So in our marriage therapy group, instead of giving them therapy for six weeks, maybe we could give them therapy for 12 weeks or 18 weeks or any multiple of six. I guess it doesn't have to be a multiple of six, but you get the idea. And so at the end of the study, these people have been therapied to death. And if it works, you better believe you'd see a difference. So that's number one, make the means more different. Number two, use a one-tailed test. What? Use a one-tailed test, that's all. What's a one-tailed test, you ask? Good question. So based on the sage advice of Fisher, we want to keep our probability of committing a type one error at 5%. So what do we do? We decide based on our histogram, if it falls beyond this point, that we're going to conclude that the treatment actually worked. But here's the thing, sometimes in life, we don't know whether it's going to work or gonna make things worse. Like maybe you're looking at the association between early stressful life events and later functioning or something like that. It's possible that these early stressors can make people worse later on, but it's also possible it can make them better, make them stronger, more resilient, that sort of thing. So if you don't know, and it could happen on either side, there's a 5% chance it could be this way, and there's a 5% chance it could be this way. And if you add those up, guess what? You got a 10% chance of committing to type one error, not a 5% chance. And so if you have no idea whether it's gonna be on the positive side or the negative side, guess what? You gotta split that probability in half. So now the score that is different enough from zero has to be even more extreme than it was before. In other words, you're paying for your uncertainty. But if you can predict a direction, who cares about that other side? You're gonna put all your eggs in one side. Oh, your probability in one side, something like that. So in short, a two-tailed test, we split the probability in half, two and a half percent on one side, two and a half percent on the other side. But with a one-tailed test, because we are hypothesizing a specific direction, we put it all on one side. Now, one thing to look out for here, let's say we predict that therapy will actually make people better in their relationship satisfaction. And so we do a one-tailed test. But let's say it actually made people worse, like way worse. And so let's say they're now super far from zero on the other side. You can't reject the null hypothesis, dude, because you predicted it would be on that side and it fell on that side. So that means you can't conclude anything. Make sense? So that's number two. We use a one-tailed test instead of a two-tailed test. That'll give you more power. Number three, we can change the alpha level. So instead of saying we have a 5% chance of committing a type one error, we say we have a 10% chance. By the way, that's kind of cheating, but it'll give you more power. So basically that means we're going to increase power, but we're also going to increase the probability of committing a type one error. Number four, which is probably the best strategy is to increase your sample size. Remember how the variance of the sampling distribution shrinks as n increases? So if the variance shrinks, then it becomes much more likely you're going to detect any differences that might exist. Number five, this is the easiest strategy to get statistical significance, but also the most unethical, and that is to p-hack, which we will talk about more in the next video. So with that, let's review our learning objectives. Number one, understand the null and the alternative distribution. The null is the distribution of no difference, and the alternative is anything but that. Number two, understand how the central limit theorem is used for hypothesis testing. When we are hypothesis testing, we are looking at differences between distributions of means, not distributions of raw scores. And when we're talking about distributions of means, guess what? We are talking about the central limit theorem. Number three, understand how power relates to the distribution of means and how to increase power. Well, we got the five ways to increase power, don't forget. Number four, understand the difference between a type one and a type two error. Type one error means you falsely reject the null hypothesis or you falsely conclude that your treatment worked when it actually didn't. And a type two error means that you falsely retain the null when the null is actually false or you conclude your treatment doesn't work when it actually does. And then finally, understand when to use a one-tailed test versus a two-tailed test and what that means. We use a one-tailed test when we are predicting the direction and a two-tailed test when we have no idea. By the way, almost all software packages, if not all of them, default to a two-tailed test, just so you know. And number six, low-key 
like, subscribe, and comment. So did I use that in the right context? Yeah? Apparently I'm still a dork. All right.